I didn't intend on writing a show. I didn't intend on writing a solo show. I just started writing. And then I would be writing. And as I was writing, I would just sort of start talking out loud. And then that sort of started forming some characters. And then it started taking place into a shape of a script. Hello, you are listening to the Late Bloomer Living podcast, where we are reimagining and redefining what it means to be in midlife, where we are gathering energy, momentum, and excitement for our next chapter via candid conversations with other midlifers about their own pivots, pitfalls, and triumphs. I'm Yvonne Marchese, your host, and I'm so happy you're here. Adulting can be hard, but you don't have to go it alone. I created this podcast to give you inspiration and let you know you're not alone in feeling stuck in midlife. Both men and women are welcome here, but if you are a woman, I also invite you to join our Midlife Uprising community for women, where we're making waves and reimagining what it means to age. Being part of this community for women will remind you on a regular basis that you're not too old and it's never too late to do that thing you've been thinking about. You can find more information at latebloomerliving.com forward slash community and I hope to see you there. Hello, my friend. I am so stinking excited about today's conversation. My dear friend, Lynn McNutt, is joining us for a second time on the podcast to talk about her experience writing, producing, and performing her first one-woman show at the age of 55. Lynn plays three characters, an old man, a baby blue whale, and a middle-aged woman. Her characters are all, in their unique way, searching for family, dealing with grief, and wanting to communicate to loved ones that are gone. The first workshop production of Blue, A Rhapsody in Blubber, is opening this Friday, May 5th, at the Theater Lab in Boca Raton. Lynn is a 35-year veteran of traditional theater, and she has performed in international and national tours, off-Broadway, and at such theaters as the Kennedy Center, Arena Stage, the Shakespeare Theater, and the Goodspeed Opera House, just to name a few. But this is her first time writing, producing, and performing her own words. And not only is Lynn back, but joining in the conversation is the director of the production, Erica Batdorf. Erica is an international artist who has been performing, directing, and creating award-winning performance work for over 30 years. Erica has also been instrumental in helping Lynn develop this product. So they're here to talk about it together. It has been a labor of love that has taken six years from conception to production. Six years. If you've ever wondered what goes on behind the scenes of developing an original show, this conversation is going to be so juicy for you. And even if theater isn't your thing, I think what Lynn has accomplished is an inspiring story that goes way beyond the theater world. It's a story of courage, of someone betting on themselves. When was the last time you put your neck out to do something scary? The very act of doing something you've never done before is valuable, whether or not it's deemed successful. The success is in the doing. The success is in the personal growth that comes from trying. So without further ado, here's Lynn McNutt and Erica Batdorf. Let's go. Hey, Lynn. Hey, Erica. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thanks. Good to see you. Oh, I'm my God. hear you. <laughs> I am so excited to have you back on, Lynn. Yay. Oh, my gosh. So last time we had you on the podcast, we talked about you hiking the Florida Trail. Mm-hmm. And there were little mentions of this little project that you had going on back then that is now finally happening. And I'm so excited. So your first one woman show that you have written and it's your performance vehicle as well. 
And the reason we're having Erica join us today is because Erica is directing. How did you guys hook up in this partnership? So I have a colleague at work. I teach at Florida Atlantic University. And he knows that I'm always interested in taking workshops and taking classes. And, and you know, I, I love being the student. It gets really old being the teacher all the time, right? And so he had gone to a conference and had seen a um, demonstration, I guess you would say, of Erica Batdorf's um, technique that she created for... Um, authenticity movement, you know, for actors and and that kind of thing. And he said, you know, that I'd probably really dig it. Like I should go take this workshop. So um, I was like, absolutely. So I kind of went online. I saw the information and I just sent in my little money and I just signed up for the workshop. And uh, it was in Toronto, which I was like, well, that'll be fun. So I go up to Toronto and it's May. So it's at this so it's almost yeah. exactly like six years ago, oh, wow. like right now. Yep. Six wow. Years ago. Um, and it this Florida girl w- was very confused because it was very cold <laughs> uh, up there in in May. Anyway, I ended up at the Royal Ontario Royal Ontario Museum for you know we had our weekends off, and I was in this museum, and they had this exhibit about a blue whale that had washed ashore and blue whales are the largest animal that's ever existed on our planet back then and now still like it's the largest animal and they're hard to study because blue whales sink when they die they don't float so it Mm. was this you know they found this blue whale i guess it was trapped in some ice or something um, and you know, like you see the dinosaurs and stuff in the museum. So they took the skeleton and they made this huge blue whale skeleton. And it it was pretty phenomenal. You know, it just kind of blew me away. And then, you know, they had like the lights and the sound and it was very underwater feeling and very groovy and kind of gets you in the mood. And, um, and then I was listening, they had this uh, headset where you could, you know, put the headset on and listen to what blue whales sound like, right? Their calls. Mm-hmm. And there was this little boy standing next to me and he had on his headset and I had on my headset. Mm-hmm. And when it came on, you know, I was expecting humpback sounds and those pretty whale sounds that you hear in meditation things. And it was this very like staticky, you know, um, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. Like, so, like sonar sounded like really mm-hmm. fast sonar. Right. And then when they really slowed it down, it sounded like a heartbeat. And, mm-hmm. but when we first heard the sound, this little boy that I didn't even know, he and I both just sort of jumped and like grabbed each other's hands and looked at each other like, wow, you know, <laughs> and it just, it connected us like so immediately. And that was kind of, uh, I didn't intend on writing a show. I didn't intend on writing a solo show. I just started writing and then I would be writing. And as I was writing, I would just sort of start talking out loud. And then that sort of started forming some characters. And then it started taking place into a shape of a script. And then I guess fast forward, maybe a couple of years, I had brought Erica back down because her class impressed me so much in Toronto and I just loved it. I was like, oh my gosh, my grad students are going to love this. So we brought Erica in as a guest artist. Um, No, you had me come and do a workshop on play creation. Oh, oh, right, right. Because you were like, I think I want to create something. And and so you brought me down for grad students, but you also did the workshop. Oh, Um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because she's the head of the MFA in creation program at York University. So she does all these amazing workshops and stuff with how to create material. So that was the first workshop. You're right. Um, But I want to say it was when you came down again that I was actually talking about that I had formed this, this piece. And I was telling you about it. And at one point, the whale was 
you know, taking ballet lessons or hula lessons and stuff. And I mean, you know, all the, all the like crazy things. And she, she asked me, she goes, do you have a director yet? And I said, no, but I need to get one. And then she was like, well, I think it's something I'd really like to do if you want, you know, like I could do it. And I was like, no way, because never <laughs> really here's what I think I would get the Erica Batdoor to like direct my little piddly, you know, whale skit. And um, yeah, and then we started collaborating and then COVID. So kind of got shelved for a few years, but now we're back up and kicking. So. It was supposed to be produced in 2020, right? At, yeah. At, at the theater lab in, at Florida mm-hmm. Atlantic University, right? And then COVID just was like, nope, that's not happening. Yeah. And so um, I had to kind of stash it. I took all of my stuff and put it in a big bag and just put it in my closet. And I didn't look at it for two years because it was... um you know, it was, it was depressing one, you know, yeah. um, for everybody, mm-hmm. right. Everybody's not, you know, everybody's projects got put on hold. And so, but it was also at the point where it was ready to be developed on its feet. And I knew that if I just kept nitpicking at it as an intellectual writer, mm-hmm. I would nitpick the gold out of it. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to leave it alone until I could get on my feet with another eye and ear in the room, Erica, so that we could play with it, you know, some more before, before any other kind of rewrites or anything. Yeah. Happened. But it's just so weird. Cause I was saying to Erica the other day, I said, you know, it's, it's crazy that like I, this piece was, you know, conceived when I very first met her. And so the fact that like she's directing it and we're doing this piece almost exactly six years after I met you is kind of cool. That is incredible. Wondering does that little boy that you shared that experience with, did he make it somehow into the show in spirit or in any kind of form? Yeah, he's kind of there in spirit. It's interesting. There's three characters. There's a baby blue whale, there's an old man, and there's a middle-aged woman. And, and then they all have, you know, like they all talk about different people, you know, like the, the woman will talk about her children. The man will talk about his wife that has passed away. The whale talks about where's her mother. Um, but all of the characters that we see and hear about are all not one of them is a pure, oh, this is this person, right? They're all a mix of, they're all me, but they're all a mix of lots of aspects of me, lots of different people. It's like you just took a bunch of people and put them in a big Tupperware container and then shook them all up, you know, and then dumped them out again. (laughs) Theater often essentializes, you know, so the three characters, each character is, is, is a real character, but also representative of, of emotions and, and things beyond one person. Yeah. So when did you guys start getting it up on its feet? And when did you get really involved with this Erica in the process? Well, I was quite involved in the development process. Uh, Lynn came up to Toronto and I actually introduced her to some other people that I thought she'd be excited to study with, some vo- vo- voice teachers, because I know that Lynn wanted to, Lynn is an extraordinary vocal musical theater pr- performer and um, mm-hmm. Shakespearean actor. So I knew I knew a lot of it, what are called extended voice people. Um, so I introduced you to two different extended voice mm-hmm. teachers and extended voice because she wanted to make. Whale- yeah, if you can explain that. I, I yeah. t- Extended voice is like, you know, like opera is extended voice, but there are extended voice people that can like, like a howl like a wolf or wail, wailing and keening long extended sounds. And yeah. there are probably two specialists and I happen to know both of them. And there are more than that, I'm sure, in the world. But th- there was one in Toronto and one in the Boston area. And I, it, because... Uh, Lynn wanted to do some unusually um, sound like a whale. (laughs) That's not an easy thing to do, but if anybody could do it, Lynn could do it. And I knew these people that, that would, would, 
you know, offer workshops. In fact, we did one of them together um, mm-hmm. with Maria Lowry. And then we did the other one with, with me sort of as an outside eye. So yeah. we did a lot of development work before COVID mm-hmm. to kind of figure out what kind of a world this play would live in. And, you know, we did some experimental development processes with movement to figure out how the whale moves and then COVID happened. So we were working together when we could before COVID. And now we're actually like four days ago. Yeah. (laughs) I got here. (laughs) And now we're really, this is a production development workshop, which means that it's not finished yet. The beauty of it is Lynn's put together an awesome team, a great lighting designer, sound designer, a costume and set designer, and we get to play without sort of 100% finishing it. So the idea is we're putting up up on its feet and we'll learn from that so that the, the next version will be finished. So this is a, st- we're still experimenting, but it now Lynn has a tight script. Uh, the characters are defined. So we are, we are staging it as if it's, uh, if you were to come to see it, you wouldn't necessarily know it's unfinished. However, she might call for line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 kind of long. Um, well, it it's not too long. She it's not it's long. It's not because she's fabulously entertaining. Well, thank you. But she is always entertaining. I will I say that. <laughs> I do a person to do a solo show. I mean, I've done like ten solo shows, and I would not have offered to direct her in a solo show had she not been someone who could pull off a full evening on her own. And if you know her, you know that. <laughs> She can do that. Oh, and it, 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 there is not a doubt in my mind, and it is l- literally killing me that I cannot be there for this production because I so want to be there to see. All right, y'all this. checks are in the mail. <laughs> well, I I would say though it's been a big learning curve for me, right, on many aspects, creatively, technically, you know, financially, but. It, you know, I've done a lot of traditional theater in my life. And I was thinking the other day, I've played the role of Dolly and Hello Dolly twice now. And I was thinking, well, gosh, you know, I've played Dolly doing a solo show. Why is this, you know, and it's not that I like got out and counted the words kind of thing, but I went through and I sort of was like, okay, if I, if I took everything that Dolly, all of her lyrics and all of her lines and typed them on a page the way I have my script typed, it would probably equal four pages. Yeah. Oh and my, my script is about 14 pages. So that gives you an idea of how much material it is. And it goes fast, you know, cause you're switching like, you know, between characters and so that's when I was thinking of Dolly but I was like no she she finishes a number she leaves the stage so you can look at your script you can focus on what the next scene is going to be you can get yourself ready and you know amped for that next scene and um so I'm like I'm an idiot like why did I <laughs> why did I write it like that uh but it'll it'll be fine um she says wistfully just a little bit talking about the sound, you know, and the thing is too, is I wanted to sound like a whale, sure, but I also wanted to sound like my whale, like, mm-hmm. like I'm not, I'm not trying to mimic authentic whale sounds. I'm trying to take the whale sounds that I find and kind of create uh, my own whale language and vocabulary make it something that I can sustain something that the audience can respond to but yeah all the extended voice stuff was helpful for sure I think Hi. one thing that makes us a good com- a combination is I've done experimental theater almost entirely which means I've, I'm always devising. I think I was in two shows where I was handed a script and I had to learn lines and perform. I have been in other theater companies where we created work together. And I love performers that have multi, are multi-talented. And musical theater performers have a lot of experience and they have a lot of range. You know, they know how to move, they can sing, they can dance. They, are, they often have to be comedic at times. And, and not only that is, you know, Lynn 
can analyze text before I can read it. Like her ability to absorb and analyze text is really fast. She's smart. So, so the, 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 the fun thing of me bringing to, to the table, all the experimental approaches that I am familiar with, the kind of background and devising that I come to. It's not just, I'm not a playwright, if that makes any sense. I have plays, I've written plays, but I devise on my feet. And in Canada, devise theater is a much more, I would say, popular or known thing, uh, mostly because of French Canada. And so, and so if you bring someone like me, who's a deviser, creator, director, together with someone with Lynn, who can, who can do anything, forgive me, but you can. Um, and I, and I would say that, wow. the, I would say that the combination of the two of us creates a piece that is funny, that is smart, that is also a little out of the box, but still super <laughs> accessible. It's not that out of the box, actually. It's pretty, it's pretty yeah, accessible. It's, it's like, yeah. it's like a funny, heartfelt, it, it's gut-wrenchingly moving um, piece of theater that, that is also something you may have never seen before. Mm. Mm. Yeah, all of that. I'm dying even more yeah. than I was dying before that I can't <laughs> well, here's Well, here's the thing, Yvonne, is that, like Erica said, I mean, this is, it's in development. And the whole point of this workshop is because the element that we really need in the room is the audience. Like right now we can keep playing and playing and playing and crack ourselves up and think something's really funny or think something's really, really moving. And we can hold the space with this moment a little bit more or something. We don't really know until we have an audience, you know, that the other member of the show, I need my scene partner. Yeah. And so when we get that scene partner in the room, that's when we're really going to go, oh, this works, this doesn't, this, you know, we can really, and then when it gets fine tuned, the whole point is to then travel with it, to hopefully get it picked up by a theater, hopefully be able to tour it so that there will be many opportunities to see it. Hey, we're going to take a quick break here because I want to let you know that this podcast episode is brought to you by Midlife Cues. Are you looking to live life more intentionally and grow personally as you get older? The Midlife Cues newsletter is the perfect solution for you. Every Sunday, you can open up your email to find a weekly newsletter filled with carefully researched resources and tools to help you live your best life. It's written and published by Lou Blazer, who left a successful career in corporate America and now focuses on helping midlifers be truly happy and feel fulfilled in the second half of their lives. You can subscribe today at midlifecues.com. So I'm wondering, did you ever think of when you were when you were a younger a younger lady, did you ever think about doing a solo show? Was this ever anything that was um an aspiration for you or did this purely come from this experience looking at this whale hearing it being in this time in this space that that just sparked something within you now i think i always knew that i wanted to do something like this but i couldn't define it because my experience and upbringing you know i grew up in a very typical middle-class American household um, where, you know, my father, you know, played football. My mother was, you know, a homecoming queen. Um, I went to a regular, you know, state college um, university um, where we did traditional plays and musicals. And then I went to New York City and auditioned for traditional plays and musicals. And I didn't, I wasn't aware of this world. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sure down in a church basement in the village somewhere, they were doing really cool, groovy stuff. But just because it's in the world of theater, in the realm of performance, they're completely different worlds. Like the same way that TV and film is a different world from theater. Mm -hmm. So I just, I wasn't aware that this stuff existed. Like a solo show in my head would be a cabaret, like singing, like a singing cabaret mm. show. Yes, that makes um, sense. And, you know, I've had people ask me like, why haven't I done that? And I'm like, yeah, I could do that. But it just, that wasn't exciting to me. I just, I knew that there was something out there that I wanted to do a project 
that was performance based, but I didn't know like what that world was or what that meant. And then I just started writing about this experience about the whale and, and I was in improvising. So I wasn't just writing. I was sort of like talking and improvising. Then I would get up on my feet and improvise and be like, oh, that's really good. And then I would write that down. And so it morphed itself into a performance piece as opposed to a short story or, you know, something like that. It just kind of. So you think you thought it, you thought it was a short story maybe when you first started toying with it? Did you even know? Was it like, I don't know what this is. I'm just going to write. Yeah, I just, it, yeah, it was, I don't know what this is. I'm just going to write because it was such a profound experience. Mm -hmm. And then, and then it, it just grew, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I was like, oh, this is really cool. And because I had met Erica, I had started becoming, the interesting thing is, is when I took Erica's workshop, I had no idea that she was this like internationally known solo award-winning performance artists that had done these amazing things. Um, so it's just weird. Like, it's just, huh, like this was happening in my life. And it just so happens that this person I'm taking this movement workshop with, you know, is this like, that's just one of these tiny little things that she does, but she also is this other thing. So yeah, it's, I think kind of touching on like what your show is about too. It's like when you take those risks and you put it out there, you, you draw the stuff to you that you, that you need. Um, and, uh, I don't know where I'm going with that, but it all worked well, out. You, you, you draw the stuff that you need, but you also have to be you draw the like, people. you're hardworking, you like yeah. you pursued actively. You didn't just go la 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 and trip over something. You were hungry and looking and trying things out. And you took how many workshops after you? I mean, how many, I mean, you studied with John Turner. You studied with like I would yeah. say, go study with this person. And she would like do it. And I'd be like, oh wow. <laughs> like, yeah. I was like, no, try this person. She'd be like, sure. And yeah. she'd just do it. And I'd be like, oh okay, <laughs> this person is serious. Well, and also because you knew more along the lines of, because I've always done that. Like I've always studied, I've always taken workshops and I'll ask the person I'm taking a workshop, hey, if you were to take a, you know, who would you study with? So I'm, that's how I find people because for adults, it's really, really hard to find, uh, to continue your training, you know, yeah. as you, as you get into your midlife, because it's always geared towards younger people. Training yeah. is always geared towards a student and a student we always think of as somebody that is in high school or college, mm -hmm. a typical age, right? So finding workshops that are going to fuel me and help me to grow as an artist, but that I'm going to feel comfortable taking as an adult are hard to come by. They really mm. are. So I always ask people, you know, like, where would you take? And that's led me to many different, you know, workshops, but Erica specifically now knew what I was working on and what I wanted to achieve. And so she was like, well, really, well, look at this person. Cause this person will help you vocally. This person's going to help you with improv. This person's going to help you with, you know, X, Y, Z. So she was able to help curate a. Which is actually something I've done for years. That's not new for me. People have hired me. I mean, I run a graduate program, but also. I thought I was special. Yeah, but... you, you are. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but and it's something that I really enjoy is working with mature artists, because especially if you're older, you have to put your own program together because, you know, Lynn's not a beginner. So you don't want to be necessarily in a room full of 20 year olds who've never, you know, um, so you do kind of have to, you have to think internationally at that level. Neither of us are beginners in this field, right? Neither of us at our age are starting in performance. You know, Lynn is doing a solo show, but, you know, she's director she's you know um so what's new for you is the writing and the and the solo aspect it's of like it. a yeah. deepening yeah. of of the yeah. it's a deepening of the experience as a performer as a creator right i i see you going deep here yeah. you know <laughs> sure that's that's really funny because that's in the show <laughs> yeah Dive, dive, deeper. dive, deeper. dive deeper we have to go deeper <laughs> we have to go deeper i have to go deeper yeah that's very funny that is funny. And what, that's hard and it's it's scary. It's scary. It is scary. It I I have this theory that uh-oh. <laughs> uh -oh. Um 
I have this theory that if we can continue to put ourselves in the position of being a learner, being, you know, being a beginner at something, and that's what I see that you've been doing here, Lynn, is constantly putting yourself into workshops so that you are not the expert that it's uncomfortable because it's, you know, I think it's the key to continuing to grow as a human is to continue to put yourself in these situations. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I would also say too, that it's really important for if you're, if you are an an actor, anybody in, in the arts, you don't take workshops and things that you're always just comfortable with. Right. But also you're taking workshops that are, are outside of your field, you know, like as actors and, you know, as theatrical people, our plays aren't about theater, right? The play isn't about acting. The play isn't about theater. So taking workshops in gardening, getting your scuba license, right? Learning how to drive a boat, going for walks, like taking classes in, you know, if you're an, if you're an actor, take a painting class. If you're a painter, take an improv class, right? Because those are going to influence your work because the plays that we do, they're about, you know, human connections and about life they're not about acting and theater yeah i also think that two two thoughts one a lot of people think they have to do it alone and and that's what lynn didn't make the mistake she's like she was like okay i need help what do i what help do i need how do i get it you know so much of being a performer is is the skills that you have um and unfortunately film and tv has tricked us into thinking it's how you look and whether you're compelling and you know and that's that's not what an actor is. Actor has an extraordinary amount of skills that take a lot of time and repetition. You know, like Lynn is an exhausting show for her to perform. And she's smart enough to be like, she's like, okay, I need to run it every day. And that's not easy to run a, a solo show, you know, and I can say that from experience. And that's one of the reasons why I'm directing and not doing another one. But, uh, you know, the, the practice, the practice of whatever it is that you're entering into, you have to be willing to practice. And that, that takes a commitment and you have to be excited about it enough to practice, but you also need help when you practice, meaning take a workshop, get support, find the ways to support what you're doing. Cause you can't, especially when you're starting out, it's fairly hard to practice something when you don't know much about it. So you have to take enough workshops so that on your own, you can start to practice. Yeah. And I do want to mention, I mean, you said Lynn might be calling for lines, but I'm, I'm looking at the calendar here. We're talking on April 20th and you open in early May, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You got time, girl. You got, you yes. got time. He's going to be fine. You're going to be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know how it is. It, how's it going to, ha- how's it going to work? It's a mystery. It's a mystery. <laughs> well, it's also the calling for line thing is so that we can continue to experiment without getting stuck in. You know, like if, if, if we decide to like two days before we open that we want to try something new mm. so we and we can, and she yeah. can call for line rather than, than, oh, I love than that. stressing Lynn out around, oh, but I won't be able to remember this. Well, let's try it. Let's try it one night anyway and see how it goes. And we'll just have someone on book. Yeah. It gives, gives permission. And I do think that in any time you're learning something, giving yourself some crutches, fear, no crutches, <laughs> <laughs> you know, get the support you need. Yeah. Uh, but when you work on something and you've got it down and then you're like, okay, I'm, I'm doing this thing and I, and I know it. Okay. But now you're going to do it and we're going to play this music while you're doing it. And then it, all of it goes right outside your head, but then you get used to it doing to the music say, okay, now you're going to do it while listening to the music and filling bags with goldfish, <laughs> packing a school lunch. Right. And then it, you know, it goes out your head. And so it's not even so much the lines it's if we change the music. Right. Yeah. So, okay. Let, let We haven't brought up age yet. Um, Erica, I think you said you just turned 61 last July, right? No, no, 60. I'm headed to 61. You're heading to 61. Gotcha. Lynn, how old are you now? I will be 55 on May 17th. It's coming after right now. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. And here you are, midlife and 
I do want to ask you, I know you're, you're, you're still in process with this, so I don't know how much of this you can answer or, or know for yourself yet, but what, it, what do you, what have you learned about yourself with this process so far? Oh my God. I don't know. I've learned that. I know it's, it's a hard, hard. <laughs> Um, I, so uh, a couple of things I've learned to trust myself more and I've learned to bet on myself. Like I've learned, you know, kind of talking about going back to the age thing that I, I, I know it will be okay. You know, I've been through enough situations in this business that I know it's all going to work out. I know it's all going to be okay. I don't know. That's kind of a really lame answer. I wish I had something profound, but it's just bet on myself, trust myself, all those. We have to edit that out. That'll just sound dumb. (laughs) (laughs) I I do not think it sounds dumb, Lynn. And and I'll say right now, I I may veto that suggestion (laughs) because (laughs) while while you're struggling with it, I, because it's, it's a hard question. It, it, how do you, you know, half the time when you're in the middle of something, how do you evaluate like what I've learned learned not to write something so long. (laughs) (laughs) I keep making her cut it. And she's like, no, (laughs) I I can say, I can say, I've never, I didn't see her play. Hello, Dolly. I didn't see her before this, but I think she's, her acting is amazing and has improved. And what I think that I see when you asked earlier, because we had been talking about older performers I think the nuances and the depth of performance that older performers have is something that we rarely get to see, you know, because unfortunately ageism, especially for women means that we don't see them, you know, in England we do, which is why I love British television, but, and, and we don't have, you know, if you stick to traditional theater, you don't have the range that the range that Lynn gets to play in this solo show challenges her and she can meet it and and so it's it's an opportunity as an actor which you don't get as as a woman very often right Um, and I think that that's where the betting on yourself comes in because you know nobody's gonna write this for you Lynn this 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 is you betting on yourself this is you creating your own opportunity and Mm -hmm. and you know writing something that is juicy which you know, if there is a, an older woman in a piece, how often is it a good role? Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. It's usually very limited and doesn't, doesn't go on very long. And like, there's only so many women that can play mother courage. Right. <laughs> so it's like, they're just, yeah. And we are all fighting over those same roles if we're in that industry and it's just, it's, yeah. and they're not very interesting after a while. It's like, they're out of date they're written by men. They're not really from our point of view. They don't include hot flashes. Like none of the real <laughs> stuff is in there. And yeah. I think that's time for that to change. And I think it's really important that we, you know, I think there can be a way that there's so many theater things that are funded, uh, but don't make money. And there's also this, this myth that, oh, I'm because I'm funding it, because I'm making it happen, it somehow has less value. Mm-hmm. just an inaccurate representation of what happens we all know that most of broadway doesn't actually make money right a lot of it starts by well-meaning people that fund something that lasts for a little while and then it dies and so i think to believe in yourself and also to have to, to be able to to put money on the table for it is a really really hard thing to do um, yeah i would say the one of the biggest challenges too is because i'm the one that wrote it because i'm the one that's in it, the only one that's in it, marketing it for me is difficult Mm -hmm. because I feel like I need somebody else to sell it because I, you know, you both have said incredibly wonderful things. It's like that we can't say those things about ourselves, but yet I need people to know these things in order to sell this, this piece, but me going, Hey, you really have to read my play. It's amazing. You know, (laughs) like that's just, that's just weird and nobody's going to believe you. And so that's, that's, that's been a challenge. Yeah. So that's always a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And then also because I don't know. It's good. I know it's good, but (laughs) I'm in the trees. 
Of course. Back before, you know, I can't, yeah. yeah, like I'm in the, I'm in the weeds. Like I'm in the, I don't, I don't. Yeah, every I, show I've ever been in, I've never know. I'm like, okay, I think this is good. Or, oh, I don't think this one's good. But you don't know. You you are in the trees. Yeah, plus, a lot of it. shows that people love, like, you know, there are shows that are famous shows that have toured the world, and I see them, and I think they're terrible. Like, who's deciding it's good, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many shows that people love that I don't like, and there are shows that I like that other people will be like, that's terrible. So it's subjective. Yeah. But you like my show. I do. So <laughs> now I'm worried. <laughs> 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 oh my goodness, ladies. Thank you so much for taking time out of the rehearsal schedule to talk to me about this. I am going to be sending you all kinds of good love, Lynn, for your opening and uh, thanks. wishing uh, you all the best. And Erica, it's been really a delight to meet you. Likewise, I hope you do get to see it. Yes, because it's going to have legs. It's going to move part. on. It's it's going to come up to to my part of the world up here in the Northeast. And uh, that's going to be a thing. And we're going to definitely get to come see you. Yay. Well, yeah. thank you, Yvonne. You're the best. Mm. Love you, honey. Love you. Thanks. All thanks. right. Thank thanks, ladies. Well, there you have it. A baby blue whale, a middle-aged woman, and an old man walk into a bar. Sorry, I couldn't resist. And that one's for you, Lynn. So, my friend, if you happen to be anywhere near Boca Raton in the next couple of weeks, get your tickets and let me know if you go. I will be absolutely green with envy, but still very happy for you. If you want more information about the show or want to know where to buy your tickets, I will have a link to Lynn's website in the show notes, along with a link to Lynn's Instagram feed so you can follow her and see what her future adventures are. I have a feeling that Lynn is just getting started. You can just go to latebloomerliving.com and look for episode 142. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you have a fantastic week. Stay safe and well. Talk soon.